morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO. I am so pleased to introduce today's program, Social Media's Dark Side, which could not come at a more timely moment. Leading the conversation is Roger McNamee, an American businessman, Silicon Valley investor, and venture capitalist. Roger was an early investor in Facebook and personal mentor to Mark Zuckerberg. But since 2017, he has been working to trigger a national conversation about the dangers of unregulated technology giants like Facebook. Roger's 2019 New York Times best-selling book, Zucked, Working Up to the Facebook Catastrophe, Waking Up to the Facebook Catastrophe, Deal details his realization of Facebook's dangerous business model and his reckoning with how we as a society must work toward change. Roger's work came back into the public spotlight this month after Facebook whistleblower Francis Hagan explosive testimony before Congress. We're so lucky to have Roger with us here today to unpack this critical moment. Roger will be in conversation with Professor Terry Kramer from the UCLA Anderson School of Management. He teaches about the impact of disruptive innovation on products, services, markets, and competition. We also want to acknowledge this program's partner, the UCLA Anderson School of Management, and welcome the UCLA Anderson students who are joining us for this discussion today. For those of you who would like to submit questions to Roger and Professor Kramer, there's a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. Claire Krellitz, our Marketing and Communications Manager, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion of today's program, which will start in about 30 or 35 minutes. Professor Kramer and Roger, thank you both so much for joining us today. I'd love to turn the program over to you so we can get right to work on this important topic. Excellent. Kim, listen, a big thank you for that uh, uh, introduction and thank you for the partnership between UCLA Anderson and the Los Angeles World Affairs Council, which is a critical one in learnings uh, for everyone. And let me just say, I've been looking forward to this event. I, I can't think of a more timely issue that is affecting not only technology and technology companies, but affecting society more, uh, more broadly. So Roger, I'm looking forward to a variety of questions. I'm gonna start with the first two or three questions, just getting a level set on the problem as you see it. And then I wanna get into what do you recommend should, uh, should happen uh, here. And so Roger, let me just start out. You've got a fascinating background, as Kim mentioned, where for 34 years, you were a tech investor and something happened where then you made the shift to becoming an activist. Tell us what, what happened that caused that pivot. So Terry, I have been one of the luckiest people on earth. I began my career in the investment business on the first day of the bull market of 1982. I was assigned to cover technology and I had a long interest in technology before that, but it was incredibly timely because it was right before the personal computer became a big deal. And as a result of being at a firm, T. Rowe Price Associates, which was the largest uh, mutual fund company focused on technology, having the job as the tech person, I had a front row seat as the personal computer industry became big. Then I started a firm. I moved to California in 1991, joined Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield and Byers, the venture capital firm, to create the first crossover fund. And so I had a front row seat there when Kleiner Perkins was, of course, the initial investor in Netscape, Amazon, and uh, Google. And then I started Silver Lake and then eventually Elevation as the world changed and I had different opportunities. So I was deeply embedded. I was a true believer in the power of technology to make humans more successful. And beginning in about 2011, I started to see things going on culturally in Silicon Valley that were a challenge. But when I met Mark Zuckerberg in 2006, none of that was obvious. Mark was 22 years old. The company was two years old, it had 9 million members. It didn't even have Newsfeed. Newsfeed is the product today. And it didn't even have that. And I was involved from 2006 to 2009, which really, I mean, it's the paleolithic age of, of social media. 
And I really was convinced that he would have 100 million users in English speaking countries and he'd build a really nice business. Because when I first met him, the things that he did that were different from the companies that came before in that category, MySpace and Friendster, was that he gave people control of their privacy who could see their stuff and who couldn't. But secondly, he required authenticated identity because you had to use your school email address. And I was convinced that if he maintained those two things, Facebook would always be a safe place. And of course, what I didn't realize was that in Mark's mind, those things were tools he could use to scale the business more rapidly. It simplified the network architecture to have those two things. And that in fact, at the first opportunity when he didn't need to worry about them anymore, he would abandon. But that happened after I was I was done being involved. In 2016, I had retired from the investment business because things in Silicon Valley were changing. The culture beginning in 2011 shifted to something really predatory. And you know, companies like Uber and Lyft and WeWork, um, you know, the same thing was true of Spotify and a bunch of others, that they built business models that used data and they use technology to take advantage of the weakness of other people. And, you know, that was the best that Silicon Valley had to offer. It was going to be really successful. And I could not, in my own value system, continue to operate that way. So I retired. And in early 2016, I started to see things on the company I was involved in, Facebook, that really disturbed me, specifically violations of civil rights, people using the ad tools of Facebook to violate civil rights, and then people using the ad tools to undermine the Brexit referend referendum in the United Kingdom. And I reached out to Mark and Cheryl on the 30th of October of 2016, so nine days before the presidential election. And I sent them a draft op-ed that says, there's something about Facebook's culture, its business model, and its algorithms that allow bad actors to harm innocent people. And I go to my friends, my former mentees, and say, there's an issue here, and there's a moral problem and a business problem. The moral problem is you don't want to be undermining civil rights and democracy, but there's a business problem. You're in a business of trust, and if your users believe you're responsible for undermining democracy and civil rights, that's going to be bad for you. I was hopeful that I would be able to persuade them, and I spent three months trying to do that. It did not work out for reasons that I think we can all guess now. I was faced with a moral choice and I decided to become an activist and to try to make the world aware of this problem that I saw. Because the issue isn't technology. The issue relates to business models, it relates to culture, and it relates to this notion that human psychology evolves very slowly. Many of our core aspects of our psychology are left over from when our biggest fear was a saber-toothed tiger, right? So flight or fight, things like that. Yeah. And the problem is computers move very rapidly. And now we can collect data everywhere. And so we can put people at a tremendous disadvantage. And Silicon Valley has made a business out of doing that. And they've gotten incredibly wealthy. But the damage to our society is incalculable. And I feel it's my duty to try to share what I know, to have a conversation. What I would ask each and every one of you, you don't have to believe me, but join me in a thought experiment for this hour. And just for the purposes of this thought experiment, imagine that what I'm saying is correct, that it's true. How would you behave differently? How would you look at your own life if it turned out that what I believe is true? And then you can make your own judgment whether you believe it or not. But, but that exercise is a healthy one for all of us. Doing these thought experiments, about imagining things that maybe are outside your comfort zone and asking, would I do something different? Yeah, let me uh, drill down on that, Roger, about the idea about how bad is the situation at Facebook versus other tech companies. Yeah. We talk a lot about data actually being used in healthcare to help diagnose. We talk about it powering in the future autonomous vehicles that will reduce accidents, et cetera, et cetera. Is Facebook in a unique category of its own? Or actually, you're saying, you know what, you're worried about every single tech company that's out there. So let me start with Facebook and then we'll talk about the broader issue. Facebook, I think today is the worst offender, but I will tell you, it is a race and they don't have that big a lead. So let's talk about what makes Facebook such a problem. 
there are two parts of it. One is the architecture of Facebook, and the other is the architecture of this business model called surveillance capitalism. I'll start with Facebook. Mm -hmm. So Facebook has brought three billion people together on one network that has no walls, no fences. One of the consequences of that is that ideas that ordinarily and historically have existed only at the fringes of society have access to the mainstream. So things like white supremacy, things like anti-vax have access to everybody. Now, Facebook could have chosen to prevent that from becoming mainstream. They could have said, you know, as they do with pornography, we're not going to have scams and we're not going to have extremism, violent extremism be promoted inside our, our uh, platform. But that is not what they chose to do. And they were not alone. Now let's go to the business model. So we explain how that works. Yeah. So there's a professor at Harvard by the name of Shoshana Suba. She wrote a book a, a couple of years ago called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism which is, in my opinion, the equivalent of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, in that it takes the prevailing economic system, a brand new system, in its early days, and it names the elements, describes how everything works, how it evolves, and what was likely to happen. It deserves, in my opinion, a Nobel Prize in economics. It's the most extraordinary book. It's very dense, but trust me, if you read it, it will change your life. So the basic notion is this, computer systems and technology systems today allow for data gathering everywhere. So think about how Google has street view. They drive a car up your street and take a picture of your house, dog, cars, everything, and they claim ownership. The thing about surveillance capitalism is it begins with this notion that corporations are allowed to claim as an asset any data they touch. So they're in their ordinary course of business, they're gonna to touch a lot of data, but there's nothing to prevent them from going into public spaces and capturing all that data and claiming ownership to it. So things that previously belonged to others or belonged to the public as a whole, they're now claiming as their own. Mm -hmm. And the reason this matters is that they've now gathered data about every aspect of human life. And they look at all of it and use a technology called machine learning to find patterns. Because as I said, humans haven't evolved that much from the saber-toothed tiger, so that we do behave in predictable ways. And so the critical thing is to, to map all of those predictable behaviors. They then take the data for each and every one of us and create a unique model for each person. And keep in mind, if you're Google or Facebook, you have a ton of data from your own system, but that is just the smallest part of what they do. Because Every time you do anything on a cell phone, so your location, text, app, anything, all that data is available in a third-party marketplace for them to buy. Anytime you do a financial transaction, anytime you get a medical test or a prescription, remember, HIPAA protects you when you're in the doctor's office, but nothing protects medical tests and prescriptions. And if you have somebody's medical tests and prescriptions, you actually know everything about them. And so all of this data is available. And they, from that, they create this model of each person and they use it to predict our behavior. Because again, they know what the patterns are. So they identify which types we are. And then they use recommendation engines to control the choices available to us and to manipulate our behavior. Because for reasons that relate to 50 years of technology doing great things for us, we trust technology too much. Mm -hmm. And so the key thing to understand is if they used all of that power to make our lives better, either to make us smarter or healthier or more successful, well, that'd be a good thing. I mean, Terry, your point about, you know, using it in medicine, right? That there are good uses of artificial intelligence, but as it's currently being applied, the most profitable uses of it are to exploit human weakness mm -hmm. for profit. And Facebook didn't invent that model. Google invented it. And now the whole economy wants to do it. I tried to buy tickets for the dog show the other day. Ticketmaster would not let me make a transaction until I'd given them my cell phone and they'd verified it. A friend went to get a COVID test. And the place they went, a private place, said, please give us your medical history and all your prescriptions. 
they're not doing that because it's related to what they're what you're buying from. They're doing it because they want to participate in surveillance capitalism. And every company in the economy is doing this. So when we think about how much of this is Facebook and how much of this is broader, the key thing to understand is that Facebook gives us the opportunity. Their behavior is so bad that we can go in and use them as the forcing function for government regulation. But we need to recognize that as long as CEOs of private corporations are judged on one metric only, which is shareholder return, if you are only judged by one thing and nothing else matters, mm -hmm. then by definition, all of your energy is going to go into the one thing. And Mark Zuckerberg can make a legitimate case that he's no different than any other CEO because what he is doing is optimizing shareholder value. So when we go back to that thing of bringing 3 billion people into one network, with surveillance capitalism, you now know things on Facebook about people that were never available to marketers. The inner self, because we're there with family and intimates and we share things on Facebook we don't share anywhere else. That data is valuable to everybody, but it's most valuable. The people who pay the most for it are scammers anti-vaxxers, white supremacists, people trying to undermine elections, people who want to do human trafficking, people who want to do illegal drug trade. For them, go Facebook, Google have been a goldmine because these are unpatrolled commercial things where the entire ecosystem they want to reach is available on one network. And again, Facebook could have chosen to stamp on that, but they did not do so. They actually create a lot of tools, and you've seen this in the context of presidential elections. You've seen it in the context of the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. What Facebook has done is actually to bias everything in the system towards the extreme voices, because those extreme voices are engaging. For the same reason, when we're going by a car wreck on the highway, we have to look at the car wreck. You're drawn to hate speech, disinformation, and conspiracy theories, not because you believe in them, but because your self-preservation left over from the days of saber-toothed tigers makes that an involuntary reaction. And Facebook exploits that, as do every other player, as does every other player in surveillance capitalism. Yeah, let me ask you on that last point, Roger, you talked about two drivers of either good or bad outcomes. One is business models, and the second one was culture. Right. Are there tech companies, and I'm thinking of Mark Benioff at Salesforce, the founder, CEO of Salesforce, that um, really talk about culture, they talk about a North Star, they talk about multiple stakeholders, not just customers, they talk about society, communities, et cetera. Is there a path for tech companies to be good here? And there's a bunch of good ones. Are you kind of saying, no, there's a lot of, lot of bad stuff going on here? So, so Terry, there is a path, but it requires people to do something that runs contrary to the mantra of optimizing shareholder value. Mark Benioff, for me, he's a dear friend and a hero. I've known him. We've known each other way more than half of our lives. And he is exactly as you described. He has made a bunch of choices that I think reflect values that are really admirable. At the same time, we shouldn't pretend that they don't participate in surveillance capitalism. They do. The portion they participate in is the less harmful part of it. But he has to be ever vigilant. And I talked to him about this from time to time, because, you know, I want to help him always, you know, watch out for the things that are difficult. I think Apple's done an amazing job trying to protect consumer privacy. Mm -hmm. And right now they are the equivalent of the government. They're the only thing standing between us and just being completely abused by platforms like Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Google, mm -hmm. and, and TikTok. And so, but the core issue, Terry, is the culture of business in America has lost sight of any kind of civic responsibility, any kind of responsibility to employees. And you're starting to see the effects of that, right, with strikes and, and employee actions. And I'm 100% on the side 
I say this as a lifetime investor. I, I'm 100% on the side of labor on these issues because a lot of this has been done on the backs of them. And there are really ugly versions of it, like uh, Uber and Lyft or DoorDash, where the entire model is based on exploiting people who don't understand the true economics of the business, right? Where you can deceive them. And uh, where California, we passed a horrible referendum, um, Proposition 22 in 2020, that was, you know, essentially converts these people into sharecroppers. I mean, it's just, it's awful. And, yep. you know, and, and, you know, so in my mind, the, we have a choice here. Facebook and Google, their value system, this is not about right and wrong. This is about competing value systems that are incompatible. Facebook and Google are driven by engineering values. The top of the engineering hierarchy is efficiency, which if you're making a motor or a small software product, it's a fantastic thing to optimize for. But they also marry it to scale and speed because they live in a world where the United States is deregulated to the point where there's very few rules for business and the few we have are not enforced. And so there's no constraints. And so in that environment, with the mantra of shareholder value, they're going to push as hard as they can to optimize earnings, which is their right. Okay. The country is faced with this choice, though, because at nation scale, which is where Google and Facebook are, efficiency comes into competition with democracy and self determination, which are the values on which the US was built. And the problem with democracy and self determination in this battle is that they are inefficient by design. Democracy requires deliberation. It moves slowly. Efficiency, when you marry it to speed and scale, doesn't care about any of that. It just blows it away, which is why you see consistently these companies aligning with authoritarians and standing up to democracies, because authoritarians are more efficient in their mind. And so that's a more natural relationship. And, and my point here is we've never had an honest conversation about do we really want democracy and self-determination. Do you want to choose the clothes you wear every day? Do I want to choose clothes I wear every day? Do you want to have a democratically elected government? Because these two things are not compatible. And right now we've set up a set of rules where if we just leave it alone, the internet platforms and tech companies are going to win. Their vision will be, we will live in this thing that's like a hybrid of China and Russia, right? A combination of a kleptocracy with this techno uh, authoritarian governance model because every day right the rules of facebook have way more impact on our lives rules of google than the, the laws of the country right most of us don't get anywhere near breaking the law but we're constantly running up against things that facebook and google do which are completely arbitrary and which for which there's no appeal because they're unelected governments and again i don't see them as bad i just see them as having a different value system and again in my thought experiment i ask everybody to sit there and go which one do you want to line up with? Mm -hmm. you, you, you still have a choice, but if you wait long enough, you won't. Yep. Let me now shift in, Roger, to what should be done. Yep. And we think about, I mean, I'm obviously got a business background. You kind of think about what should be done. It's always in several categories in this case. One is self-policing. Basically saying companies, you got to self-police, self-regulate to create better outcomes. A second might say, hey, listen, is there a technology solution to what you're talking about? Can you use AI for good here to say, I'm gonna find misinformation and disinformation on a social network, and I'm gonna use that as part of my content moderation. Or do you feel like, you know what, we've been through all of this, nothing has happened or nothing big enough has happened, and we need regulation, we need litigation, we need to be more punitive here. Tell us about the, the range of solutions here that you think are relevant. So I would culturally like to see the United States decide it wants to be a democracy, it wants self-determination, and that culturally we would like corporations to be part of that. So you know, we're going to say to corporations, sorry, but optimizing just for shareholders doesn't make sense. We really want to get back to the vision of the 50s and 60s where there were five stakeholders, you know, shareholders, and you might value them the most, but you've got employees, you've got the communities where employees live, you've got customers and suppliers, and you have to, to some degree, balance all of them. I mm -hmm. think that would be super helpful to apply that broadly, okay, some version. For tech companies, we've tried self-regulation. It doesn't work. And in fact, it doesn't work in any industry and it really doesn't work here. 
um, doesn't work at all. I think we need to have a combination of legal and legislative change. So because we've lived in an unsupervised situation and the companies view themselves as governments, so they don't believe that they're beholden to us, they've actually appear to have broken a whole bunch of laws. In Facebook's case, there are at least six that I can see for which we have publicly available evidence. You know, the Facebook files series that Francis Haugen, the Facebook whistleblower, did with the Wall Street Journal, for example, has a whole thing on human trafficking. Human trafficking is a felony. And there is no doubt that Facebook participated in it and knew. That looks really clear cut. Mm -hmm. um, there's insider trading case in state of Delaware, six pension plans, including some state employee pension plans, have a case against Facebook related to Cambridge Analytica, in which if you just simply look at stock sales versus public disclosure, there appears to have been a violation of insider trading rules. Mm -hmm. um, there is a Texas anti uh, attorney general has an antitrust case against Google with Facebook as co-conspirator for price fixing, which is also a felony. Uh, there, in that Delaware case, they talk about revenue recognition, that maybe the disclosure was incorrect relative to user counts, relative to ad views, relative to the promises they make to advertisers. Revenue recognition fraud is also a felony. The point is the criminal, there, and there are lots of other examples. The criminal justice system has some investigations it needs to do. Some of them by att state attorneys general, some by the DOJ, and a couple of them by the SEC. And they really need to do that. That is their job. They're there to provide uh, consumer protection to all of us. But then the legislative thing has to happen. And the problem is Congress is currently broken. So it's gonna take time. You need the legal stuff to buy you time. The threat of, of loss of, of liberty is a great incentive for very significant compromise. But let's remember, we've been down this path before. The building trades in 1870 were responsible for massive fires in all big cities in America. We created building codes with personal liability, legal liability for participants for failing to adhere. The food supply was unhealthy in 1900. We passed a set of laws making the food supply healthy. We did the same thing with pharmaceuticals. We then banned child labor in 1938 because we said that is un-American. And then in the 1960s, we started passing environmental laws because the chemical industry used to dump toxic waste indiscriminately in fresh water and on mountainsides and things like that, destroying both public health and the environment. So we have to one, recognize we've been here before and that regulating important industries is actually a core function of government in the consumer interest. I think there are three categories, safety, privacy, and competition. Safety, the issue here is it's not just internet platforms. AI is dangerous, it is unsafe. Deep fakes are unsafe. Mm -hmm. Facial recognition is unsafe. Smart devices like Alexa or uh, ring doorbells or that Astro robot that Amazon wants to make, they're unsafe. Smart TVs, smart cars, self-driving cars are incredibly unsafe. Cryptocurrencies are unsafe. It doesn't mean they can't be made safe, but it just means that right now there's no incentive to make them safe. You have to change the culture. I think we need an FDA for tech products that sits there and says, I'm sorry, there is today no commercially useful application of deep fakes, no commercially viable application of facial recognition. You have to have a special permit. You can only sell it to law enforcement. That strikes me as a no brainer. And I think for things like Facebook, Google, et cetera, they have to pass a test every year. And they have a set of things that they have to fundamentally change to make themselves safe. And it's a requirement with you know, felony things if they fail to do it. I think that's the first big piece. You hear people talk about section 230 of the Communication Decency Act is if we fix that, that'll fix everything. That's only for internet platforms and it's only for part of the safety problem. So I'm all in favor of that. I'm a big supporter of a couple of the bills in Congress, but we need something bigger. Privacy is essential. Surveillance capitalism is about taking away self-determination, human autonomy, using data as power to inflict things. I believe it is as immoral as child labor. Child labor was about taking away the humanity of kids. This is about taking away the humanity of everybody. I would ban it. If, if you can't get all the way there, then at least ban any third party use of location, 
health, financial, web browsing, and app usage. Those things are too intimate, right? And so you have to protect people. And then lastly, competition. The antitrust laws were made 100 plus years ago for an industrial world. We live in a data world. We need to update them. We need to give people tools because right now these companies have power that it doesn't just harm consumers. It prevents alternatives from coming to market. Mm -hmm. Good. Let me ask you two last questions uh, because then we want to go to the audience uh, questions. And the first question is fundamentally about unintended consequences. I remember from my days at the State Department and in business, you know, anytime you're putting forward policy, legislation, et cetera, you always want to think about what could go wrong, what could create a negative outcome. If I were to ask Facebook, I assume, you know, Facebook would say, listen, in its defense with almost 3 billion users, it's got a free model. Most of the users, we think you know, all the users are in the US, the vast majority of Facebook users are outside the US. They're in India, they're in Pakistan, they're in Brazil, they're in Indonesia, et cetera. And that ability to offer something free in a market where the willingness to pay is low, you're kind of creating a huge risk on revenue that then would force them to start charging for Facebook. And then all of a sudden you find people don't have a connectivity solution that, that might be ideal. Um, how do you think about the unintended consequences so that the solutions you're talking about are all, always net positives and not create a, a net negative? So the status quo is demonstrably a net negative in every one of the countries you just described. So in Myanmar, Facebook enabled and did absolutely nothing about and ethnic cleansing that killed tens of thousands of people. They wound up triggering uh, sectarian violence in Sri Lanka. They have empowered dictatorships in the Philippines, in Cambodia, in Vietnam. They allowed a, uh, the subversion of an election in Brazil. They've allowed what may have been the subversion of an election in India. So the critical point here is this thing that you're describing is in a sort of a, a positive in these countries. I don't think there's any way to describe the status quo as positive for any of those places. What they have done is to create a platform that the powerful can use to impose their will on the powerless. Mm -hmm. And that is clearly not better than having no communications at all, which is what was that was the situation in Sri Lanka, or sorry, in uh, Myanmar when they went there. There was literally nothing. And, uh, you know, there was no newspapers, no television, no telephones, and Facebook became the whole thing. Now, if Facebook did the work, that would be one thing, but they don't. And you see this in every language other than English. There's essentially no moderation. There's essentially no attempt to protect the people, and the problems are staggering. So the unintended consequence of doing nothing is that you're destroying these countries. And again, I look at this and say, the thought experiment we should run is, would the world would be better off if Facebook were completely gone and we started again? Because it would take you a matter of weeks for alternatives to develop and probably a couple of months before you decided which one was gonna win. So <laughs> the note, we should not, none of this is inevitable. There are much better visions of technology available. And I mean, from 1956 to 2004, technology to a first approximation always empowered the people who used it. And beginnings in, two, in 2010, technologies for the most part has been about undermining the humanity and the economic value of each person it touches. That is not a good thing. We, I mean, again, if we got rid of all these companies and started again, I think we'd be wildly better off. Now. Because I think engineers are really smart. And if you said to them, these are the constraints you got to work around, they will do a great job of that. We both know that. Yep. That's what they're good at. Okay. When you give them no constraints, they take the shortest path possible because that's efficient. And the shortest path is the one that harms the most people. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not because they're bad people. It's because we've created a culture where that's legitimate. And the thing is, if you pull out the CEOs of Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Amazon, the other 495 CEOs of Fortune 500 envy Mark Zuckerberg, 
And if they were put in the same place, they would, with almost no exceptions, do exactly what he's doing because they would follow the mantra of maximizing shareholder value and they would use this incredibly powerful business model that Mark has created. Hmm. I mean, again, it's not useful to blame Mark. I mean, you, there are things he's done that I would not have done and that make me very unhappy. But our country has allowed this. We've, we've said this is okay. And I'm sitting there going, why did we do that? Mm -hmm. Good. Last question for you. And then we're going to go to audience uh, questions here. How likely is legislation and changes in regulation in the environment that we're in in the U.S., which is fairly divisive and lack of agreement on Capitol Hill on a whole host of issues, how likely is uh, are changes here? And if you say, well, it's going to be pretty difficult, does it put you back into this kind of self-regulation mode, improve culture, raise the, the, the awareness about multiple stakeholders? That ultimately is going to be our, our salvation here. So, so Terry, I think that we need to frame this a little bit slightly differently. I want to move it about 10 degrees. I think that the trade-off here is the same trade-off Congress is fighting over voting rights, which is to say that these companies are part of the larger battle for what our system of government is going to be. Are we going to be a democracy, one person, one vote? Or are we going to run in a minority rule thing where capital has control? Right now, we're in that latter one. And the question is, are we all collectively going to work together to take us back to a situation where we insist on one person, one vote and democratic values? Mm -hmm. And the reason it matters is that in this country, the communication systems created by Google, Facebook, and others are core substrates for the deliberation of democracy. So they have an enormous amount of control on how this turns out and the choices that they've made in the context of presidential elections, the choices they've made relative to, to COVID, the choices that they've made relative to you know, the scam economy have had a profound effect on undermining the country. I mean, Facebook's own research says 64% of the time somebody joins an extremist group on Facebook, they do so because Facebook pushed them into it with a recommendation. That means Facebook may have radicalized 2 million people into QAnon, which the FBI a year earlier had warned was a ex dangerous extremist group, and Facebook ignored the warning. They, 2 million people. Now, all of the people who stormed the Capitol were believers in QAnon. All of them. That was the common value system. And Facebook provided the organizational tools that they used to organize the actual stop the steal and then the actual insurrection. And so you sit there and you go, wow. You know, when you were having the conversation, the choice of self-regulation, that, that's not a real choice. The choices are, do we allow these guys to do what they're doing, or does the country recognize that government is us and insist to its elected representatives, get off your butt and, and restore democracy and restore some balance of power between capital and the people who live here? because the current one's unsustainable. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're know you either gonna go to full-blown authoritarianism with some sort of repression of the masses, or you're gonna return to something which goes closer to one person, one vote. And we can't just sit here and listen to the World Affairs Council and go, well, that I did my job. We have to be calling our members of Congress. We have to be calling our state legislatures. We have to be calling our attorney general, right? State attorney general and saying, excuse me, this is your job. I mean, you need to call our California Attorney General and go, hang on, this is happening in your state on your watch. People are being harmed. You can't just sit back and go, this is not my problem. But if, if, yeah. if we all say it's not our problem, then those guys are right, okay? Right? If we let Congress get away with this, because what's weird is this is the one place where Republicans and Democrats actually agree on a lot of the stuff. The real problem here is that Facebook and Google and people like them have too much power to influence things at the margin. And our system of government is designed to move slowly, so it's really easy to stop things. It's really hard to get things done. Facebook and Google only need a half a dozen members of Congress to stop any legislation from happening. Yeah. And we'll, if we allow that, then it's our own fault. Fascinating. Let me go to Claire at the World Affairs Council, and she's going to share some of the audience questions. Great, yes, thank you. I'm 
pleased to join both of you. Um, before we launch into the Q&A session, I'd like to thank our members and viewers for your continued support. We depend on your donations and membership to cover our expenses so that we can continue to bring these important discussions. So if you're able to make a donation, please go to our website, www.lawath.org, and click on the donate button or become a member. Thank you again. So let's we have a ton of questions um, coming in so I'll try to get through as many um, but let's start with the uh, the whistleblower so will Facebook whistleblower Francis Hoggins testimony spur lawsuits and or reform is this going to be a big inflection point in your opinion Roger I surely hope so now I do not know Francis Hoggins well I have spoken to her I know the team around her very well um, I think she is incredibly courageous. She's unbelievably authoritative. I mean, she is an expert in algorithm design. The documents that she brought out were created by the experts within Facebook, really hugely smart people, working on reports at the behest of management team that were then shared with everybody at Facebook, right? So and this is these were public documents inside Facebook, and she brought them out, and they show unequivocally that across probably dozens of different categories facebook always optimized profits over pe people was always willing to allow harm to persist or get worse if fixing it would slow them down and so there some of the things like the thing with uh, human trafficking are actually felonies and you know, not everything was in that stuff. They didn't share with employees any of the stuff around January 6th. They didn't share any of the stuff relative to the games they play with advertisers. This was mostly public facing stuff because of issues raised by people like me. And it's really amazing. And she's so incredibly articulate, so convincing. There is no excuse for Congress. There is no excuse for the justice system not to act now. This is the test. And I believe if all of us call our member of Congress, if all of us call the AG of the state of California, that will really help. All right. So a lot of people really liked uh, your ideas about creating some sort of FDA for tech. Um, but what is the long term feasibility or projection for anything like that, like the FDA for tech becoming a reality? Do we need to break up big tech like we did with the monopolies of the past? So th this is. First of all, thank you to everybody who's listening. These are great questions. So you notice I didn't talk about, when I talk about antitrust, I didn't talk about breaking them up because to me, that's the last tool you use in a large pro procession. I wanna focus on fixing the culture, either getting rid of or changing the business model, and then creating an environment in which alternative models can come to market. When we're done with all three of those things, then we can break the companies up. Feasibility FDA. Right now, it's it's an uphill battle. There are no bills in Congress to do this yet. This is frustrating, but I'm on the case, and uh, with luck, uh, I will work with the House Energy and Commerce Committee to create a bill that does precisely this. They've been very fixated on Section 230 because they've been fixated on internet platforms. My point is we've metastasized past internet platforms. We need to do a bigger thing now. We're going to take what we can get. We want to get there. But again, if everybody here calls your member of Congress, calls uh, Pelosi's office, the Speaker of the House, calls Schumer's office, and says, we need an FDA, calls the White House, we need an FDA for tech. That will help a lot. Great, uh, good, good marching orders for after the webinar. Um, okay, so moving outside of the U.S., uh, there's two related questions. So Facebook is a global company. How are they being regulated in, in other countries, and should the U.S. follow suit? And then, sort of as a follow-up to that, if the U.S. does regulate Facebook. Will that have any benefit to the 90% of their users who are outside the US? So if you just want to this answer. is such a this is such a good question. So Francis Haugen is testifying before the European Union on Monday. So in Europe, they treat privacy as a human right. Here we treat privacy as literally an, you know, uh, something we've traded away. 
So we, we in the country, we have no national privacy laws and state privacy laws are not enforced in a way that provides any real privacy, including here in California, where I worked very hard for CCPA and CPRA, which are our two privacy things, but you know, they are not yet where we need them to be. The Europeans have some power. They have some tools that they can use that we do not have here. And I'm very hopeful that armed with all the evidence that Francis Haugen's bringing them, that they will act. The issue in Europe is that they pass great laws and then don't enforce them. And it's partly because there's so many countries in Europe. But GDPR, the global, the general data protection regulation they passed in Europe is the reason that at the bottom of a lot of things, you get this thing where you can opt out on data and you have to do it every single time. GDPR has a, it, it had a lot of influence on that. The California rule is the reason we get it in California. But the form of it is a form that they created in Europe. There are no miracles coming here, okay? We're gonna do this one at a time. If you live in Sri Lanka, if you live in Myanmar, if you live in Cambodia, if you live in uh, uh, the Philippines, if you live in Brazil, none of the things we're doing here are currently targeted protecting the people in those countries. Inevitably, because these countries need a one size, fit, they want to automate everything. So they want a one size fits all solution for the whole world. That if every country does the thing that's right for that country, that you'll get the benefit of all of those little changes. The sum of those changes will become what gets imposed. So I'm in favor of every country doing their own thing. So Australia took the first step. I think Canada's looking at some stuff. France and Germany have done some things. This is really important. We do not need coordination. We just need people to act. We need people to act on the thing they care about most and to do the most aggressive possible thing and then force the hell out of them. Great. Um, okay. This person says, I have been unable to easily get medical test results information from Kaiser Permanente for over two years because I refuse to check the acceptance box for the online portal. I read the document and it provides them with unlimited power and no liability. So how can a person function in a world now that requires our submission? And if not, then our lives will be so much more difficult. So to the person who asked that question, I feel your so I ran an experiment starting four years ago where I stopped using all Google products and then stopped checking boxes like that. And it is a nightmare. I told you the thing by buying tickets on Ticketmaster. I finally conceded because, you know, there are other ways for them to get my cell phone number. Um, the problem with activism is that there are very few rewards and there are some, there's real friction. I do it because I think it, it's morally really important. And I have experienced the thing that you're experiencing. I don't have a solution. Um, if more of us did it, that would help. If all of us did it, that would help instantly. Um, but the trick is all of these tools give people convenience. And we live in a culture where we trade things that really matter for short-term convenience. So we trade things with permanent effects on our lives for a benefit that lasts for 30 seconds. And that's insane, but that is where we are. And I don't have the, the solution to that part of it. If you do, please let me know what it is because I think that's one of the hardest things about this. And I go around, I speak to groups like this and the, you hear these stories over and over again. And I live the story myself. So I know what it's about. I mean, I'm trying to upgrade my email system. My partner's going, well, what's the privacy issue? Why do we care? I'm going, what are you talking about? We can't go to on a cloud-based Google apps or on Microsoft cloud-based apps because they reserve the right to look at them all and Google absolutely does. I mean, you know, I need a private thing and I need a private thing even if I have to pay for it myself because they might be interested in what I'm working on, right? And there's little and nothing to stop them from taking it if I'm on their system. And, you know, I go to these activists, right, who are trying to fight against this thing and they're using Google Cloud. I'm going, are you insane? Why would you do that? If you want it, if you're going to do this thing, if you're an academic department trying to create a thing to, to find a fix, you can't use the tools that created the problem to fix it. You have to use tools that don't create the problem. And the problem is that's less convenient. And we're also used to convenience that 
we are where we are. And it's hard. And I don't want to pretend I've got all the answers. I've just got thought experiments to help us all through them. Great. Um, so sort of on this topic of, of individual action, um, this next person asks, have we as humans gen generally strayed too far from the realm, realm of personal responsibility and accountability, expecting regulations to save us from ourselves? Another incredible question. This is, I'm so glad I'm in front of this group. So when I wrote the first draft of Zucked, I spent a lot of time talking about the things that we could do to protect ourselves. Because I mean, I, by the way, I'm never gonna stop thinking about the poor person from Kaiser Permanente. I, I truly, truly, truly respect you for doing that, sir or madam. Thank you. Um, and I don't have a solution, which makes me feel really terrible. But on this issue, um, this stuff's being imposed on us. It's not our fault. People say, should I get off Facebook? Should I get off Instagram? Should I get off of, of uh, you know, YouTube? And I go, it's a very personal thing. If you have a small business that you run on these things, you they're monopolous. You don't have a choice. If you're a rock and roll band, I've got a rock and roll band. It has to be on Facebook. There's no way around it. It's the only way bands communicate with fans. Now, I'm, I personally don't do Facebook, but the band has to be there. And that makes it really difficult. But the important thing to understand is this, they want you to think it's your fault. It is not your fault. They are using, they know everything about you. They know, they have the psychological profile of you and they're using it to manipulate first your choices. And then when they get a chance to manipulate your actual behavior with recommendations. I mean, does anybody here think that the people who stormed the Capitol on January 6th, if you'd asked them two years ago, would any of those people say attacking the Capitol and attacking police officers was a patriotic act? No, there's no chance. They were all manipulated into believing that in the last two years. And that's what we're up against. That is not, I mean, that part of it is not their fault, right? Now, should they have used some judgment along the way? I would argue before you attack a police officer, you probably should use some judgment. Before you attack the Capitol, you should probably use some judgment. But the manipulation to believe in QAnon, that's on Facebook. Okay. And, you know, and it's on some, shall we say, some unnamed political leaders who use that to undermine democracy. And, you know, that's where we are today. The point is, I would love to be able to do it all over again, but we don't get to redo. We got to play it from here. And, from here, it's hard, and it requires all of us to roll up our sleeves and be willing to do something like that wonderful person who's fighting Kaiser Permanente. I mean, that's that person is my, you know, sole person because that's that's. I mean, that's we each got to find the area we're willing to do something in. I'm not telling you all to imitate what I do, but pick the thing you can do. Whether it's calling a member of Congress, whether it's <clears throat> joining Indivisible and pushing them to do something, or you know, whatever it is, whether it's fighting against somebody over data, each of us has a way to do that. But, but here's one thing, right? On the personal responsibility for parents, do not give young kids smartphones. I don't know what the right age is. Is it 18? Is it 16? It's pretty clearly not under 16, okay? Giving them that because it's convenient for you, I get that. If you're a single parent, I get that. But the reality is the harm being done to teens, part of that Facebook files that Francis Haugen brought out was how Instagram works, right? Which is how TikTok works, which is how Snap works. These things are demonstrably unhealthy for kids. And having a smartphone is a portal to not just that, but a hundred other bad things. And Building cultures around this technology was a mistake. And the question is, are we going to figure that out before it's too late or not? Yeah, lots to think about. Um, so combining two questions here, who in the US either in the government, like whether it's the government or the private sector is leading the fight um, on, on Facebook and tech and this kind of stuff? And then also, what about Facebook's oversight board? Are they doing anything? Many hold uh, the oversight board in high esteem. What are your thoughts? The Facebook oversight board is a public relations exercise by Facebook. It is an 
arm of Facebook's communications team. It is controlled completely. They're, the members of the oversight board got conned into the thing without realizing that. They're trying to flex their muscles, but the entire thing is, is essentially controlled by Facebook. And I don't think there's anything the oversight board can do about that. So, um, you know, don't look there. Um, so who are the leaders? The Biden administration's appointed some extraordinary people to critical positions. So Lena Khan, who is the head of the Federal Trade Commission, is extraordinary. And um, she is a committed tech reformer. Jonathan Cantor, who has been appointed but not yet approved to be the head of the Antitrust Division Justice Department, committed tech reformer. Uh, Tim Wu from Columbia University is on the Council of Economic Advisors, committed tech reformer. Um, Rohit Chopra, running the Consumer Financial Protection Board, was previously on the, uh, on the Federal Trade Commission. Extraordinary tech reformer. And there are others in the administration. Um, and so we have some really good people there. Now, the institutional friction is really high. FTC and the Department of Justice have been more up and on these issues for 40 years. So they don't have muscles on them. So these guys have a big boulder to move. In the Congress, um, the leading lights, there, there's a bunch of them. Uh, on any trust in the House of Representatives, the absolute undisputed leader for both House of Congress is David Cicilline from Rhode Island. He's extraordinary. And he understands that any trust is a blunt instrument. We really need to do safety and privacy. So he is becoming an expert in all of that. He really gets tech. I mean, really in its roots. And the way Congress works is there are just a handful of people who get these technical issues, whether it's healthcare or military, right? A few people get really deep in the weeds and the rest of Congress follows them. And Cicilline is perfect. Um, also in the House, you have uh, Anna Eshu from California. She, believe it or not, Google's in her district. She's been a real leader here. Uh, Tom Malinowski from New Jersey, who deserves our support. Extraordinary. The two of them have been doing things to reform Section 230 that are really, really, really good. Um, and there are uh, there's Chan Schakowsky from Illinois. She runs the uh, Consumer Protection Subcommittee of the Energy Engineering and Commerce Committee. She's going to be the leader on safety and privacy if we can get forward on that. Uh, Frank Pallone, who is the head of Energy and Commerce, he has entered the fray with a, a terrific new bill rel relative to reforming 230. So on the House, on the House, we've got a lot of people, and the Speaker is wonderful on this stuff. So we've got a lot of people in the House. There are some well-placed people trying to stop us, but you know, that's Congress. On the Senate side, it's a more amorphous. Um, uh, Senators Klobuchar and Warren have been uh, the thought leaders broadly. Klobuchar on antitrust, Warren broadly on, on tech policy. Um, uh, Blumenthal from Connecticut has been very good. Uh, I, I'm very hopeful that, that the historical experience of Senator Markey from Massachusetts um, and Sherry Brown from Ohio will be real positives. There's a lot of folks who've picked one part of it. Kathy Castor from, from uh, Tampa, who's in the House of Representatives, terrific on things related to kids, right? Ed Markey, that's been his thing as kids. But it turns out the kid thing is core to the whole problem. And so if you solve the, the only way to solve the kid problem for real, solves it for everybody. So um, I'm, I'm super, super hopeful. These are, these are wonderful, wonderful questions. And again, do not get the sense that we're close to an answer. We need a lot of political pressure to make this stuff happen. Great, well, I'll ask one final quick question uh, before turning it back over to Terry. So why hasn't Roger McNamee testified before Congress? He makes the situation very clear and the need for specific action very clear. That's what Congress seems to need to hear. So I work with Congress every day of the week. I have not testified largely because of a series of accidents. I've been invited a number of times. And in one case, they, the hearing changed, the subject of the hearing changed, so I got that went away. In the other cases, we had scheduling conflicts. Uh, but I'm with Congress all the time. And uh, I, the, the fact that I haven't testified, there are a lot of good people who can testify. I'm good at synthesizing the problems. Often when they do a testimony, they want somebody who's a domain expert on a narrow thing and go much deeper than I can go. Uh, but when they want to understand what they ought to be doing, they call people like me. And so 
do not, thank you, I, I take, I'm flattered by the question. Um, I'm not in any way troubled by my relationships to Congress. I'm troubled by the state of democracy. I'm troubled by the fact that most Americans do not perceive that they have a role in our government. And that is very disappointing. Great. Well, thank you so much. And Terry, I'll turn this back over to you. Good. Well, let me start out at the outset, Roger, to say this lived up to the expectation. I, you know, I was looking forward to this session for a long time and fascinating. I always like to share a few of the takeaways that I got, uh, the key messages from you. And I've got several of them here, and then I'll turn it back to, uh, to Kim. The first message is this epic battle between efficiency and democracy that that is what's going on in the tech world. And we have a variety of people that are not really kind of acting as they should from a, from a business uh, setting. Second point is business models and culture, that those are the key drivers of what are gonna be the outcomes. And when those get imbalanced, when culture isn't right and business models kind of take over, you can have some really big uh, uh, challenges. Um, third point, Facebook is the main offender. There are a bunch of them, but that one deserves special attention. Fourth point is there's a path to better behavior here. And on the business side for solutions, um, really thinking about stakeholders and stakeholder management. Are you thinking about not just shareholders, but employees, customers, suppliers, and maybe most importantly, community and society? Um, couple last points, self-regulation isn't enough and isn't working, and we're gonna need other solutions. And you talked about safety, privacy, and competition. And the final point, which to me is the same as the beginning point, is there's again an epic battle between democracy and efficiency. And we shouldn't lose sight of the importance of democracy that's created such great outcomes in the US. So Roger, unless I got anything wrong in any of that, I just want to extend a huge thank you to you. Well, Terry, thank you. And especially thank you to the LA World Affairs Council for giving me this opportunity. I just want to encourage everybody to recognize that government is us, democracy is us. And I'm a business person. I believe technology can be a constructive force in society. Right now, the combination of concentrated economic power and this absence of any kind of cultural uh, limit on behavior, is that's, that's the, our challenge. And each one of us has a role to play. Let's just find it and do it. Well, well said. Very, very helpful. Let me turn it back to, uh, to Kim to, to close. What a powerful discussion. Professor Kramer, Roger McNamee, we are so grateful for your time and expertise today. Sobering, but so critically important. Thank you so much for your time. Entirely my pleasure. For our viewers, we have put um, Mr. McNamee's book, Zup, Waking Up to the Facebook catastrophe in the chat. Also the book that he referenced, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Ms. Zuboff. So please check those out. For, for next week, we've got some terrific upcoming programs. Tuesday, Politics in the Time of Coronavirus with politics professor Dan Schnur. On the 27th, U.S. Senator Todd Young, who's on the Foreign Relations Committee, he will be talking about competition with China. And on November 1st, Peter Martin, a Bloomberg journalist who specializes in China's uh, security issues, will be talking about the making of wolf warrior diplomacy. Please go to our website at lawacth.org and check out our upcoming programs. You can watch all of our past more than 200 live streams for free on our website, as well as become a member, make a donation, Everybody stay safe and we'll see you next week. Thank you.